Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In module 1 of this course, we will get introduced to the role of health and education in human development and in the process, we will get introduced to some ideas that fall within the scope of Economics of Health and Education. Let us have a look at uh, the contents of today's uh, lesson. Uh, we will uh, look at a brief outline of the scope of our course. Uh, the health and education outcomes, why they are critical links to human development is the second topic that we will cover in this lesson. And the third topic that we will cover are uh, the investments in health and education and what is their impact on uh, growth and development. We will look at some of the scholarly ideas surrounding this uh, topic of why investments in health and education is at all important uh, and what is their impact on growth and development. Now, let us begin by looking at uh, what falls within the scope of economics of health and education. Now, let me begin by uh, telling you that the uh, scope of economics of health and education is vast. It is an ever increasing discipline and ever expanding discipline within the field of economics and uh, so much so that it is trying to integrate itself into the larger discourse of public health these days. However, what we will try to do as part of this course is to limit ourselves to some of the basic tools that is used within economics which will help us to understand and further our ideas on uh, health and education. So, we will uh, study the market for education and health. We will see how the market for education and health functions, how are the so called goods uh, the, the way we understand goods in economics, the way we understand goods is economics can be, uh, can be used to understand the market for health and education. How are the various products for health and education or services as we would like to uh, call uh, the uh, services for health and education, how they are traded within the market and what are the anomalies that exist with regard to when such kinds of goods are being traded within the market. So, in that context, we will also study the microeconomic foundations of understanding how health and education are traded in markets. We will look at the income and development linkages to the pathways of education and health. Uh, we will also interrogate some of the social objectives or what are the social objectives of providing access to health and education. In the process, we will see if there are any conflicts. Uh, uh, when we are trying to meet the social objectives of providing access to health and education, what are market failures when we are provide when we are trying to provision uh, services such as health and education, and what can be the policy responses when such market failures arise uh, in the context of markets for health and education? Uh, a brief foray we will make into the health insurance market. We will also study the returns to education, private and social returns to education, health and education inequalities particularly in the context of developing countries but with references to developed countries on the global north and also the contemporary issues surrounding state of public health and education in India in reference to the other countries. Now, here I have just briefly uh, opened you up to the scope of the course that we will be taking as part of this uh, NPTEL uh, course. However, as a part of this module in the second lesson, I will go into the details of what are the things that we will cover and uh, what are the limitations of how much we can uh, cover as well. Now, let us uh, go to the uh, first uh, topic of today's lesson. Uh, which will uh, basically help us to understand the role of uh, health and education within the sphere of uh, development and growth. How does it impact development and growth or whether or not it is important at all to understand health and education in the uh, context of development and growth. Now, let us begin with the agreement that human beings are both ends in themselves and well and as well as uh, means uh, to development. As human beings, we all deeply desire human development and poverty eradication. Now, while this statement can be unquestioningly accepted, uh, social scientists and economists have interrogated this question for the longest time now and have come up with a number of reasons as to why we need to pursue human development and a much narrower goal such as poverty eradication. Now, let us look at some of the reasons. One reason is of course that human development is an end in itself. Uh, and when we are saying human development is an end in itself, it can be unquestioningly accepted. There is no justification that can be given further to why human development is an end in itself. We all desire to live long, we all desire to have a good quality of life uh, because that is the basis of being able to uh, pursue any goal in life. 
Secondly, human development is a means to higher productivity. If you live longer, if you are in good health, if you are well nourished, if you have good access to healthcare services and so on, then you are a well performing labor in the market. So, a well nourished, healthy, educated, skilled and alert labor force is a very important productive asset for an individual to be able to perform well in the, in the market. Thirdly, human development reduces human reproductivity. You know, the history of uh, the last 100 years have shown us that uh, with increased uh, access to uh, services, with increased access to uh, better standards of living, fertility rates have come down. The demographic transitions that we have seen in different countries of the world has shown us that when survival rates of children increase, when ch child mortality declines or maternal mortality declines, there is always a tendency on the part of families to produce lesser number of children. So, declines in reproductivity is an important aspect of um, human development, which means that for in pursuit of a better quality of life, we want to have stable families with lesser number of children, but however, more productive uh, workforce within the country. Human development is also very good for the physical environment. Uh, we know that both poorer individuals as well as poorer countries are some of the causes uh, are uh, to uh, bad environment as well as victims of uh, poorer environment because of the social practices of the uh, poorer individuals in poorer countries of the world, lack of industrial regulations of uh, poorer countries of the world. Uh, it adds to various kinds of environmental wastes and as a result, uh, poorer countries as well as individuals also become a victim of uh, bad environment. So, in that sense, human development is also good for the physical environment. Uh, reduced poverty contributes to a healthy civil society because there are lesser disturbances, uh, more equal access to basic conditions of living uh, leads to a more peaceful existence within the society and uh, one has to be in agreement with the fact that uh, democracies across the world strive for a peaceful uh, civil society such that uh, you know work can go on as usual. So, human development and poverty eradication has a lot of political appeal as it may reduce civil disturbances and uh, as well as increase uh, political uh, stability. Now, the UNDP uh, has uh, made a very remarkable statement in 1990 when it came up with its first uh, human development report. Uh, I say it is uh, remarkable uh, because it is a remarkable statement as well as a policy changing statement as it de-emphasizes the importance given to income alone as the driver of all change. So, the UNDP in 1990 said that people are the real wealth of a nation and the basic objective of development is to create an enabling environment for people to enjoy long, healthy and creative uh, lives. So, it is important for us to understand human development as enlargement of people's choices. If we can understand human development as enlargement of people's choices, then we will instantly see the role of health and education in ensuring human development. Uh, underline the uh, term enjoying long, healthy and creative lives. Now, these are some of the basic uh, foundations based on which people can enjoy and people can actually enlarge their uh, choices. Uh, it is in this context that one needs to see what role whole uh, health and education can play in enabling an individual to pursue a creative life. Now, national income figures are essential for assessing economic development. As a student of economics, everybody would know this. But people often value achievements that do not show up directly in income figures and that is where the problem lies. That is where one needs to interrogate into other social indicators or other uh, important achievements that people value and that needs to be brought into assessment of economic development and uh, growth. Now, in this context, many fast growing uh, developing countries have realized that their high GNP growth rates have failed to reduce socioeconomic deprivations, particularly in health and education. Therefore, income is a means and definitely not an end in itself. It may be used for essential medicines or medical services, drugs, etc. But well-being of a society depends on the uses to which income is put to. Uh, the classic example that we take in economics is that of a household which may have a modest level of uh, income 
but the uh, educational achievements of children may be very different in the sense that a girl child may be less educated than a boy child and so on and it is not very hard to come up uh, to find such kinds of examples in the context of Indian society or many other developing countries of the world where households as a unit of decision making often make gender differentiated decisions with regard to where they want to spend their income on. So, you may have a modest level of income, but you may not choose to spend your income on the education of a child, on the education of a girl child. There are many households that would want their children to go and work in the fields rather than spending on their education. Therefore, there is no automatic link between income and achievements of uh, human developments, particularly in the context of health and education. Now, let us try to understand this with the help of an example here. Uh, this is an example which I have taken from the UNDP HDR report of 1990. You will see six countries. There are three countries in the upper panel and three countries in the lower panel here. What we have done here is to simply place uh, a few indicators side by side. You have GNP per capita in US dollars, life expectancy in years, adult literacy and infant mortality rate. Life expectancy and infant mortality are indicators of health achievement and adult literacy is an indicator of education achievement. You would see here that uh, in the upper panel, Sri Lanka, Jamaica and Costa Rica, if you compare them with the countries of Brazil, Oman and Saudi Arabia, you will see that they have relatively lesser levels of income. Their income levels are not as high as the countries of Brazil, Oman and Saudi Arabia. But if you look at their uh, HD achievements or human development achievements, particularly in the context of health and education, they outperform that of Brazil, Oman and Saudi Arabia. Now, this is an example of how we can assess the levels of development in a country that it is not necessary for income levels to be very high to be able to come up with better social development uh, achievements or social development indicators. So, certainly there is something else going on in the background that these data do not reveal. And on further study, further interrogation, you will always found that there is a there is an enormous role of institutions and governments as to where they are spending their money on that leads to better human development achievements. Now, it is also important for us to understand that while human development uh, refers to enlargement of people's choices. Uh, there are different aspects of these enlargement of people's choices also. I would urge you to look at two aspects of human development here. We can look at human development as a process of widening people's choices and we can also look at human development as the level of their achieved well-being. I was taking the example of a household um, uh, spending income on the education of their children. Now, if we are looking at the educational achievements of children in different households of our country, let us say, and we come up at a figure of uh, literacy rate 80 percent, 90 percent in a certain locality, then we would say that this is the achieved level of well-being in that society. However, if we interrogate further into these literacy figures and see who is it that are educated, is it boys that are more educated or it is girls that are uh, showing up more literacy rates or is there no difference or there are stark differences, then we are interrogating into the processes of uh, how these achieved well-being uh, has come to take place. So, when we are understanding human development, it is also important for us to look at the processes of widening people's choices. And in so doing, uh, it is also important for us to understand that while capabilities creation take place through widening of people's choices, it is, uh, it is entirely up to the individual concerned to ensure how those capabilities are put to use to. Again, I will take the example of income and spending income on education of children. So, high income or modest levels of income in a household is an achieved uh, functioning. However, whether I choose to put that income uh, for spending on health of my household members or on education of my household members or I try to spend all my income on something in which I am interested in and I do not care for the other members of my household will ultimately determine how much of choices that as a household I have uh, 
uh, at the end of the day. So, these are a few things that needs to be understood when we are looking at human development as enlargement of people's choices, human development as a process of widening of people's choices and of course, as the level of their achieved well-being. So, there are two sides. One is the formation of human capabilities such as improved health or knowledge or improved incomes uh, as in the case of my example and second is the use that people make of their acquired capabilities whether for work or leisure and so on. Now, in economics, we often make these two uh, important uh, bundles as work and leisure, uh, but we should not, uh, you should not take it literally to mean as work and leisure means not doing anything at all. Uh, leisure may also include a various other things that contribute to productivity of an individual. So, we may get into a discussion on work and leisure trade-offs if the course demands. Now, let me uh, come to uh, two very simple yet profound indicators that the human development uh, uh, discourse uses uh, to uh, measure uh, health status and uh, education status of an individual. I will not go into the details of it, but the reason why I am introducing these two indicators is to open up your minds to understand metrics when we are assessing uh, health and education outcomes. Now, I am sure all of you must have come across life expectancy as a representative indicator of health in measuring human progress. Now, what is the reason why one uh, tends to look at life expectancy as one of the principal indicators of human development? I have already mentioned this in the beginning of my lesson that longevity or how long we live is a principal desire of all human beings. So, which means that longevity has an intrinsic value. All of us value living a morbidity less life, a less morbid life. Uh, for the for the longest as much as possible. So, therefore, longevity has an intrinsic value. We cannot say that we want to live longer because I want to study more, I want to live longer because I want to earn more or I want to live longer because I want to enjoy something more. But longevity as a state of being is has intrinsic value because it is valued by people as it is. Okay? Longevity is also valued of course, because it helps people to pursue various goals in life. Like I may want to start an enterprise and want to live till 100. So, longevity is also valued by pe people because it helps me to pursue my entrepreneurship for the longest period of my uh, life. And in so doing, longevity has association with other characteristics. I will live long only if I am properly nourished. I will live long and be able to pursue different goals in my life only if I am properly educated, only if I have access to the good things in life so that I can, I can have some creative pursuits in my life. Therefore, life expectancy is a proxy measure for several other important variables in human development. Now, while longevity has intrinsic importance and can prove to be a very, a very profound uh, metric of human development represented as a health achievement, it is not enough to be able to assess how much progress a country has made in health uh, um, goals, we need to have more metrics. And this is also one of the important limitations as to why we are not able to conclusively establish the causalities between income and various kinds of uh, health uh, metrics. We will come to that in a minute. The other important indicator is literacy. Literacy is a very simple yet very profound measure of uh, measuring uh, uh, the uh, creative pursuits uh, that are carried out in a society because it is usually the first step to uh, having uh, to, uh, to towards pursuing higher education and better education. So, literacy figures uh, although a crude reflection of access to education is a person's first step in knowledge uh, building and in a more varied set of indicators we would also attach importance to higher levels of education and so on but for basic human development literacy deserves the clearest emphasis so what are we trying to do when we are studying when i'm trying to open up your minds to thinking of role of education and health in the context of human development first is health and education are intrinsic to human development it is undeniably and unquestioningly an important part of the human development process and an important part of enlargement of people's choices and we do not need to look very far to assess what role health and education can play in enlargement of people's choices. We can only look at very simple indicators such as longevity or life expectancy at birth and literacy rates to be able to assess how much progress a society has made as far as health and education is concerned. Okay, now, let me go to the second and the final part of this lesson that 
now we understand now we are in agreement of the fact that health and education play a very important role in human development we are also in agreement of the fact that they are intrinsic to human development they are undeniably and unquestioningly important for human development but what next do governments then therefore spend more on education and health because they are the most important indicators of human development this is one question the other question is do improvements in health and education really help to boost economic growth now there are no uniform answers to these kinds of questions although we have a sense that it probably does boost economic growth and uh, development but there are no uniform questions uh, there are no uniform answers as to by how much it can lead to an improvement in economic growth and development but research shows that extending healthcare services does boost growth various kinds of pharmaceutical therapies have drastically reduced incidences of illnesses and deaths particularly in the 20th century starting from the early 20th century to the post 1940s as well when vaccines and antibiotics came in uh, to our societies in a very big way there is also a common agreement and understanding about the fact that richer people are better nourished and educated i would like to remind you to the first uh, example that i showed about uh, six countries where i said that income need not necessarily have an automatic relationship with health and education uh, the examples that we have taken ha clearly shows that without a very high levels of income we can also have better social indicators however the general uh, conclusions that we draw from various uh, from such kinds of data is also that there is an association between income and health richer countries do have better access to uh, health and education and therefore richer countries are also better able to afford public goods that reduce disease transmission such as supply of water and sanitation now what is the rationale for uh, governments to provide health and education or social sector services uh, in the context of health the rationale for government involvement is actually very clear we know that infectious diseases spread from person to person and therefore it is both a private and a public concern now as long as it's a public concern it means that you know this is this is a kind of an economic uh, good which is uh, non excludable which means that infectious diseases uh, will transmit from one person to various other persons and therefore you can possibly not exclude a lot of people from getting the disease or getting the uh, infection from the disease and we know that illnesses are random events we are uh, doing this in the face of uh, covid-19 situation and we are all locked up in our homes and we do not have to look very far for an example of how illnesses are random events and how infections can uh, be transmitted in the public sphere and therefore it is non excludable so under these circumstances when infectious diseases are a public good and illnesses are random events it can be best tackled by pooling of financial risks and resources and this can be best done by the governments and therefore governments invest in health and they do it in various ways they do it by providing public goods for example a free vaccine is a public good by providing quasi public goods for example a paid vaccine at a lower cost a vaccine at a lower cost can be a case of a quasi public good they provide they invest in health by subsidizing access to healthcare services in the form of health insurance or in the form of direct delivery of healthcare services now the question is but by how much of public health spending should be done by the governments and how much of public health spending actually contributes to growth uh, and economic development as i was saying that we do not have any uniform answers to such kinds of questions we can only depend upon various kinds of cross country evidences to arrive at any meaningful conclusion regarding this now one of the first limitations i have already flagged off that Uh, there is uh, there is an issue with regard to uh, coming up with metrics that can help us assess uh, these kinds of causality as the, which means that how much of public spending actually leads to better health conditions and if we only depend upon longevity as um, an indicator of health let us say uh, you would know that across uh, the globe almost all countries have better standards of living these days and therefore are living longer so if we take longevity as the only important indicator of uh, human health condition and then try to do causality studies with income we may not arrive at many meaningful conclusions therefore we need to come up with better metrics 
which can help us determine these kinds of causalities. And um, uh, it is not that we do not have good metrics, we have been able to come up with various uh, good metrics that can help us establish this causality. But there are no uniform answers as I said, because every country is at a different form of development, there are various kinds of structural factors that, uh, that uh, determine the level and processes of development in a country and therefore every country needs to look up various matrices that can uh, establish causality. But then if various kinds of matrices or metrics are being taken up for establishing causality then we also land into a problem of incompatibility. So therefore the point is we still lack a meaningful health metric that can assist us in proper assessment of questions such as uh, by how much public spending should be increased so that we can have uh, you know so that better income or economic growth can be established. Similarly another important limitation is that we may be spending more on public health, we may be spending more on education, on basic education, primary education, but we may have very weak institutional frameworks. We may have very weak institutions that may undermine uh, the effectiveness of various kinds of investments. Now when I say institutions, it refers to a whole lot of uh, infrastructural issues as well as uh, schools, uh, medicals. Uh, hospitals or uh, primary healthcare centers and a lot of rules and regulations that guide the existence of these uh, institutions. We may be spending more on uh, health and education as a matter of government policy. There may be policy announcements, public policy announcements on increasing spending, but we may not have the required skill set, we may not have the required trained public personnel to be able to carry out effectively. Uh, services on the ground, then in that case even if we have increased public health spending or public education spending, uh, we may not see the results of it effectively on the ground and that may happen because of ineffective institutions on the ground. Studies also show that there is chronic absenteeism among providers, healthcare providers, uh, the budget that is allotted is very weakly executed, there may be a lot of unspent balances. Uh, on the ground when we are looking at these kinds of institutions primarily because of, uh, because of ineffective management may not necessarily be because of corruption but maybe because of ineffective management and also low accountability. When all of these issues are put together they also weaken public efforts and contribute to low returns on investment, low returns on investment of health and education. So if institutions cannot function then public spending on healthcare will not improve health let alone raise economic growth. Now we can understand this problem at the microeconomic level as well as the macroeconomic level. I will take you back to the same example of a household which has a modest level of income and is not able to achieve higher living standards. That could be because of the kind of uh, social uh, behavior or the kind of social hierarchy, social structure that the household is coming from where they are not educated enough or where they are not radicalized enough to be able to understand that they need to spend their income on uh, education or health and so on. Similarly, in the context of um, in the, it, at the macroeconomic uh, context, not necessarily at the national level, but at the level of local institutions, we may have uh, investment opportunities available, we may have uh, budget available. However, the local institution, the weaknesses that are present within the local institutional frameworks may not lead to better health and education outcomes because the budget is not properly utilized. So, institutional framework or failures of institutional mechanism in the developing countries of the world has been emphasized as one of the important reasons uh, why the link between income and economic growth is not automatically established. Now do early investments in health and nutrition improve welfare and earnings? Yes, it does, but no it does not when institutional frameworks do not function properly. Now social science research shows that interventions in preschool years have a long reach uh, in improving health, schooling and earnings in later life. A 35 year old long term study in Guatemala showed that men who received a protein supplement in their first two years of childhood earned an average wage 46 percent higher than men who consumed a calorie based supplement. Now childhood interventions, early childhood interventions as far as nutrition supplements is considered is being established as uh, uh, providing intergenerational effects as well as long term effects in the productive years of uh, the person. 
So, the, and therefore, you would see that in the form of public policy uh, interventions, uh, governments across the world provide a lot of emphasis on uh, survival rates of children and ensuring not just the survival of the children, but also ensuring that nu proper nutrition is provided to children so that we can have a healthy labor force in the long run. Now, both biomedical and economic research have shown us the striking effects of early childhood nutrition and cognitive uh, stimulation on schooling attendance, learning, adult health and lifelong earnings. Uh, if you come across uh, some of the basic uh, readings in uh, nutrition, you would see that um, uh, attention of a child in the school has a lot to do with nutrition received by the child. If a child is properly nourished, absentism reduces in the school. Uh, this is also one of the uh, guiding objectives of midday meal programs in countries such as India, where uh, the emphasis is on also producing nutrition along with uh, on providing nutrition by so, such that it can be ensured that the child comes to school, stays in school and uh, gives attention in school, which in fact has contributed largely to uh, reduction in dropouts in Indian schools. There are problems in these areas, however, this is the primary objective as to why midday meal programs have were introduced and continue to be uh, an important uh, uh, feature of uh, primary schools in India. Now, the macroeconomic studies on health and income show that people in richer countries are on average healthier and they live longer. Evidence based on cross-country regressions have shown us that wealthier are healthier. The causality runs from income to health. Uh, in a study, uh, uh, scholars have addressed the question, uh, healthier countries might be richer, but do they grow more quickly? They concluded that a country can raise income by improving its health. Right Now, the, the causality works both ways. While income may lead to better health outcomes by providing better access to healthcare services, better health also may lead to better income. Now, it is also pertinent to ask this question as to how did we get so healthy today? You know, on an average, if we are living longer, we are living longer, we are, but we are also living more healthily. And uh, this is not a scenario that existed uh, a century back. You know, it's, it's a hundred years history where we have started getting better, uh, living better, eating better and so on. Now, historically, adult productivity was compromised due to lack of uh, adequate uh, food uh, production. Data from the United Kingdom shows that until the late 18th century, agricultural production in the UK could only feed about 80 percent of its population, which means that there was a severe deficiency in food grains production. And one of the important things that has happened in the 20th century is increased agricultural production. Now, with increased agricultural production, we have better access to food, which we have better availability of food. Now, one of the first steps to being able to consume food, being able to access food is to ensure that food is plentifully available. Now, it is only a in the context of India and other developing countries, it is only a situation of the last 70, uh, 80 years or so where we actually see surplus in food production or plenty food production. Uh, about 80 years ago, we did not have plenty uh, food production or abundance in food production. Therefore, low availability of food was one of the important factors that did not contribute to better nutrition. And it was also so in today's developed nations in the UK, where until the late 18th century, agricultural production was not sufficient to feed its entire uh, population. However, gradually with increased uh, tools and implements utilized in agriculture and so on, greater output led to better nutrition levels and therefore longer working hours. Parallelly, of course, there were improvements in public health, which improved use of calories consumed and so on. Uh, some studies show that nutritional improvements have contributed to about 40 percent decline in mortality since the 18th century. The 20th century witnessed the sharpest rises in nutritional status due to abundant food supply. Advances in hygiene and education have played a more important role in reducing mortality than advances in medicine. Now, the advances in medical science and technology which happened post 40s um, uh, did uh, lead to uh, saving people's lives. Uh, because of various kinds of secondary diseases and so on. However, the first part of the 20th century is very important because in spite of the wars that were taking place, in spite of the First World War and the Second World War, nutritional achievements of people increased which contributed to declines in mortality. 
Similarly, infectious diseases incidences came down because of better sanitation facilities, availability of piped water facilities and so on, which means that even before the advent of sophisticated science and technology in uh, um, medicines and medical science and technology, mortality rates were declining because of certain social sector interventions. And these social sector interventions were in the form of these as I mentioned. And of course, these came about how? Because government started spending on social sector. In England and Wales, the sharpest mortality declines happened during the 19th and 20th centuries. Immunizations, lower exposure to infection, expanded access to piped water and sanitation as I mentioned and better nutrition were the major factors influencing improved survival rates. Reduction in death from airborne infections occurred before the introduction of effective medical treatment, mostly due to better nutrition. Declines in mortality from water and foodborne diseases could be traced to improved hygiene and better nutrition, with treatment emerging as largely irrelevant. A study carried out in New York City between 1900 and 1930 uh, saw uh, rapid reductions in infant mortality and they attributed uh, the following reasons. One, raised standards of living means income. Second, levels of education. Third, lower fertility, uh, which means that the families could give more attention to the lesser number of children and spend better on the health of the children by providing them education and also ensuring in the process survival rates of the children. Therefore, mortality reductions uh, it is established that mortality reductions happened because of these changes and not due to medical advances. A very important study from the United States based on data beginning from the 1900 shows that uh, each year of education increases life expectancy at age 35 by as much as 1.7 years, which is a very significant increase and suggests the central importance of education. And we will find several such findings in the context of the developing countries, which we will do as a part of this course. However, understanding the history of the developed countries in this context is equally important uh, because it will give us a sense. Uh, that the developed countries have also more or less crossed similar if not entirely uh, paths of achieving better standards of living or better human development conditions, better health and education uh, by reducing infections and mortality, infections and therefore mortality. Pharmaceutical therapies started only in the 1940s and they definitely changed the health landscape of the entire uh, globe. Uh, various scholars have pointed to the development of pesticides in agriculture which control disease vectors like mosquitoes. Uh, international organizations such as the World Health Organization helped in knowledge dissemination and became a very important contributory factor to uh, management of uh, diseases and infectious diseases particularly across the globe. We have evidences from other countries such as OECD countries that suggest that changes in lifestyle and non-medical advances have had bigger impact on longevity and well-being than medical advances. China is a, a striking example as to how infectious diseases came down because of interventions in public health, particularly in the form of campaigns. Uh, even before uh, the very um, hyped barefoot doctors came in in the 1960s. I will come to that in a minute. Uh, various other studies, uh, particularly from the United States, shows that effective treatments emerged only after the incidence of infectious diseases had fallen. Therefore, non-medical factors have played a very important role in reducing morbidity and mortality. Now, coming to the case of China, as I mentioned, China has historically shown much better health indicators than its income might predict. And China's better health policy has been popularly attributed to barefoot doctors who were basically minimally trained personnel who were asked to provide primary health care services going from village to village. But we have evidence that shows that most of the improvements in infant and child mortality occurred before the barefoot doctors were deployed to villages in the 1960s. And that was mostly because of public campaigns uh, advised by uh, Chairman Mao in the 1950s, uh, like for example, uh, get rid of mosquitoes responsible for malaria, get rid of rodents uh, spreading plague, airborne flies, also sparrows that were eating uh, grain seeds and fruit, which resulted in a lot of controversy, which was again changed to get rid of bed bugs and so on. So the point that I am trying to make here is that even before the advances of sophisticated medical technology, 
uh, infectious diseases and uh, various public concerns with regard to infections and diseases had already shown a decline, particularly due to public campaigns and public investments in health and education. So, we became healthy in the long run primarily due to public investments. Underlying the health improvements that countries achieved were investments for informed by advances in public health science. Periodic epidemics of cholera, malaria and other infectious diseases that plagued Europe and America during the 19th century until the science of disease transmission developed and viable interventions were discovered. Uh, studies show that contaminated water was uh, could be correlated with cholera and uh, major investments in public health in the 19th century uh, were made for uh, getting rid of uh, cholera by for better filtration of water and so on which resulted in dramatic decreases in mortality. Simply eliminating people's contact with sewage contaminated water contained the cholera epidemic in London. Similarly, the Thames embankment which helped the river to move the the waste out of London uh, led to the disappearance of malaria in the United Kingdom. Uh, studies have shown the impact of clean water on health looking at the results of adoption of filtration and chlorination by US cities uh, which attributed nearly half of the total reduction in mortality in major cities, three quarters of reduction in infant mortality and two thirds of reduction in child mortality to improve water supply. Now, what is the point of all of these when we are saying that Various kinds of public investments in water and sanitation led to better health outcomes. Now, when we are studying the market for health and education, it is not just a market of uh, direct uh, access to health products or healthcare services that matter. It is also the market for various kinds of public utilities and public services where public investments need to be made by the various governments across all the countries that has a huge bearing on the health outcomes of the population. And therefore, it is important to understand the role that public utilities and public sector has to play in ensuring better health and education which leads finally to enlargement of people's choices. Now, let me summarize this lesson uh, for all of you by, by giving you a few points as to what uh, you need to bear in mind to be able to open up your mind to a course on economics of health and education. One is of course that health and education contribute to human development process by enlarging people's choices. Second is that people's choices cannot be assessed based on an exhaustive list of functionings or material development conditions alone. They are expansive and ever increasing. The 20th century saw the largest declines in mortality primarily due to decline in infectious diseases, increased agricultural production and improved nutrition. Fourth, declines in mortality occurred much before major improvements in medical technology took place from the 1940s onwards. Finally, it became possible but how did this become possible? It became possible due to social sector or public sector investments done by the governments across the world. Example, pipe water facilities, sanitation, campaigns targeted at improving social communication and behavior and so on. So, the primary resource that I have used for this lecture is a paper by William Jack and Maureen Lewis on health investments and economic growth. It can be found in an edited book on health and growth by Michael Spence and Maureen Lewis. It is available. Uh, freely which is published by the World Bank, you may have access to it. Uh, the second primary resource I have used for this lecture is the chapter 1 of the Human Development Report of 1990, the very first Human Development Report that was brought out by the United Nations Development Program, also available freely. Uh, you can access it freely anywhere uh, that you are located. And the third primary uh, resource that I have used for this lecture is Paul Streeton's Human Development Means and End, it is a classic paper which can be found in the American Economic Review. There are a few references that I have used in this lecture which can be mainly found in the paper by uh, William Jack and Maureen Lewis from 2009. You may go through these references if any of you is interested in looking up more deeply into these issues or wants to have a more elaborate idea on, on some of these issues that I have flagged off, you are free to look up these resources on the uh, websites. So, thank you for uh, today, I will see you in the next lesson. Mm -hmm.